uh, really taking the reins and running with this event. It's, uh, it's great. Uh, so I, I do want to just take a, a couple extra moments to introduce myself uh, with another hat that I wear. I am a member of the American Bar Association's Water Resources Committee, and I am a, uh, re responsible for uh, student membership. And again, you know, student membership. Can I just see a hands of how many people here are active law students? Well, that, that's actually uh, an interesting uh, statistic we just pulled out, in that uh, there are clearly a number of you who are not active law students. <laughs> but I, I think it's fair to, uh, to broaden my comments and, and just put this in more of a framework of continuing education. Uh, how many of you are here getting some education today? Okay, I, I'm, I'm concerned I see a few hands didn't go up, but uh, you know, the, the point is the, the American Bar Association is one of the sponsors of today's event. And one of the main reasons why it has continued to support this event year in and year out is that there are, as we can see, a, a whole world of issues that are contentious, they're technical, they are, as we've learned, uh, they don't just come and go from one day to the next. Uh, in my own capacity of meeting a number of the speakers and attorneys over the last several years, uh, whether you're on one side of the table or not, uh, the number one thing that everybody is able to point to is the fact that uh, there are uh, underlying, enduring relationships that really make the water law community in particular uh, a unique niche. Uh, it is a place where uh, you can't necessarily afford to go around and, and stick everybody in the eye with a sharp stick because you might be sitting across that table from that party for years and years and years. And so with that, uh, just from my own perspective of uh, being within the ABA's Water Resources Committee, uh, I've come to respect that there is a, a, a certain amount of uh, generosity and congeniality, uh, you know, not all the time, but certainly uh, there's a, an underlying personal respect that comes with that. And I would just ask, especially the law students who are here, but I would ask each of you uh, to consider uh, joining the American Bar Association's Water Resources Committee. Uh, if for no other reason, then there are a world of opportunities for each of you to, and as we're learning from each of our panelists today, uh, there are, you know, can quickly divide the world into the, to the things you know that you know, uh, the things that you uh, know that you don't know, and then there are often the things that you don't even know you don't know. And part of the, uh, the magic of today is come to realize some of the things that you thought you knew that you don't. And I would hope that every one of us, as we walk out of here today, uh, knows that there are organizations uh, such as the American Bar Association that are not advocates on one side of the issue or the other. Uh, there are many attorneys in this room who hopefully are part of the ABA. Uh, but if you're not, or maybe if you're not an attorney, uh, you know, please consider uh, there are resources out there, whether it be uh, ongoing journals, uh, whether it be uh, just a, a network of broader community, whether it be here in Northern California, whether it be in all of California, whether it be regionally across the West, or whether people think nationally. There are tremendous opportunities for each of us to understand what our opponents have to say, come at that with a, a certain respect, and really take the time ourselves to learn uh, what are the issues, and, and most importantly, uh, where are the solutions? So uh, without much ado, I'll hand the microphone off and just ask each of you to you know, at least visit the uh, ABA's Water Resources website and figure out if there are ways that you might be able to contribute either time or other sorts of involvements to, uh, to make all these issues uh, academic as opposed to uh, as contentious as some of them are. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending. Uh, thank you for making today's event such a success. And thank you to the panelists today for the Groundwater Panel for agreeing to participate. My name is Anthony Austin, and along with uh, Seth Mansirk, and with the guidance of our academic advisor, Paul Kaibel, we uh, organized the Groundwater event today. Uh, sitting on the far end of the panel, we have Chris Fromm, 
Chris is an attorney and shareholder at Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Shrek. She serves as special counsel and provides lobbying services for municipal municipalities, utilities, private corporations, districts, and public agencies on water supply and infrastructure development projects, transportation, and air quality. Prior to joining the firm, Ms. Fromm served as a chairwoman of the board of the San Diego County Water Authority, where she represented the city of San Diego for more than a decade. Sitting next to Chris is Kevin O'Brien. Kevin is a partner with Downey Brand in Sacramento, where he serves on the firm's executive committee. The focus of his practice is environmental law and natural resources, with a special emphasis on water rights. In 97 and 98, Mr. O'Brien served as chair of the Water Resources Committee of the American Bar Association's Section of Natural Resources, Environmental and Energy Law. He has taught courses on water law at University of California, Davis, and he has authored numerous articles on water rights and environmental issues. To Kevin's left is Dennis O'Connor. Dennis is principal consultant to the California Senate Committee on Natural Resources and Water and has been with the Senate since January 2003. Before coming to the committee, Mr. O'Connor spent 10 years at the California Research Bureau, nonpartisan policy research branch of the California State Library, serving for six of those years as the Assistant Director for the Environment and Natural Resources. Additionally, Mr. O'Connor has authored numerous reports on the governance of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and of the financing of the State Water Project. Andrew Sawyer, sitting next to Dennis. Andy Sawyer is an Assistant Chief Counsel at the State Water Bo Resources Control Board in Sacramento, where his responsibilities include managing the activities of the Office of Chief Counsel involving the State Water Board's water right and underground storage tank programs. Mr. Sawyer has worked for the State Water Board since 1977, following a clerkship with Justice Samuel J. Roberts of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. He's a former chair of the Environmental Law Section of the State Bar of California and a former chair of the Environmental Law Section of Sacramento County Bar Association. And moderating today's groundwater panel is Paul Kybell, Professor Paul Kybell, Associate Professor at Golden Gate University School of Law, where he teaches water law in California environmental and natural resources law. He's also of counsel and former partner with the Environmental and Natural Resources Practice Group at Fitzgerald, Abbott, and Beardsley. From 2002 to 2008, he served as co-chair of the Natural Resources subsection of the Real Property Section of the California State Bar. And without further ado, uh, it's with pleasure that I hand the mic over to Professor Cabell. Thank you. Different type of microphone. Um, Thank you, Anthony, for your introduction, and thanks to you and all the other students from all the law schools around the Bay Area uh, for uh, your great work on today's symposium. The overarching theme uh, of this year's symposium, which was selected by the students, not by the faculty advisors, but I think it's an excellent one, is governance. So consistent with this theme, our groundwater, groundwater panel is going to focus on two particular governance components. The first will be the scope of the State Water Board's appropriative uh, right permitting jurisdiction over underground waters. The second uh, governance topic that we're going to hit on is the provisions of the November 2009 water legislation uh, which require reporting of groundwater pumping uh, to the California Department of Water Resources. Uh, our groundwater panel is going to address these two governance issues sequentially. So first, Andy Sawyer. Uh, and Kevin O'Brien will present on the topic of the State Water Board's permitting jurisdiction, and that will be followed by some discussion amongst the panelists and with all of you. Uh, we will then proceed to part two, uh, which will be Dennis O'Connor and Chris Fram, who will present on the new DWR reporting requirements. To help set up these, these governance themes, uh, I wanted to start by touching briefly on some of the ways that California law uh, and California law lawyers uh, treat overlying groundwater rights differently than they treat riparian surface water rights. They are similar in some ways, but I think the differences uh, will help set up some of the themes that we'll be discussing uh, in our panel. In particular, I wanted to leave you with uh, three examples that I think really highlight these differences. Uh, and these three examples are one, the rule of capture historically in groundwater rights law, two, the reporting requirements for riparian surface water diversions, and three, 
the application of the public trust doctrine. So first, in terms of the rule of capture, uh, as some of you may know, up until 1903 in the California Supreme Court's decision uh, in Katz v. Uh, Walkinshaw, there was no recognition of correlative groundwater rights uh, in California. Uh, the rule of law was the rule of capture, which was essentially that if you were able to pump groundwater, you were immune from liability to other parties, including other overliers for that pumping. It was a very crude law. It wasn't really a water rights law. It was a rule of non-liability. Um, in the 1903 case, Katz versus Walkinshaw, the Supreme Court repudiated the rule of capture law as it applies to groundwater rights and held that overlying, uh, overlying groundwater users uh, are restricted by reasonable uses uh, and that they must take account of other overliers, that the rights are correlative. What's interesting, though, is that in the case of riparian surface water rights, the notion that riparian surface water rights are correlative had been recognized for decades in the United States and really centuries under the English common law. So it, it really uh, arrived much earlier. Um, although the rule of capture was repudiated in 1903 by the California Supreme Court, as we know, uh, old doctrines of law often don't die quickly uh, and they often don't die easily. Um, I can cite the 2006 California Court of Appeal decision in Allegretti versus Imperial County. Uh, keep in mind this was decided 103 years after Katz. Uh, but in this case, an overlying owner sought compensation for county groundwater pumping restrictions put into place to prevent a groundwater basin from going into overdraft. Uh, the Court of Appeal uh, ultimately rejected Allegretti's claim, uh, a claim that in essence can be understood as an attempt to revive some of the elements of this rule of capture uh, and to limit the <coughs> relative nature of groundwater rights. But the mere fact that this type of a claim was presented 103 years after Katz, I think, is itself noteworthy. Second example, uh, reporting requirements. We're gonna hear uh, later today about how finally in 2009, uh, after uh, many unsuccessful previous legislative attempts, uh, we now have a requirement of reporting groundwater extractions to the state. Um, what is interesting to note, however, is that although the State Water Board doesn't have any permitting jurisdiction over riparian surface water rights, for many decades there has been a requirement here in California that riparian surface water diversions nonetheless need to be reported to the state. So once again, we see treatment um, of these different rights somewhat differently. Uh, the third item I'll touch upon uh, is the public trust doctrine, which was obviously uh, discussed extensively in the surface water rights panel. Um, there's a long line of cases in California culminating in the 1983 National Audubon case on Mono Lake, uh, which have um, held that um, the public, drugs, public trust doctrine is applicable in many instances to surface waters. Um, yet the question of the public trust doctrine's applicability to groundwaters uh, remains a subject that is still very much open to debate. Um, for instance, Rick Frank, who presented this morning, uh, Rick authored the chapter on the public trust doctrine in the um, California Environmental and Land Use Series, which probably many of us own. Uh, and in this chapter, Rick wrote, quote, numerous issues remain unresolved in the wake of National Audubon. One important question is what is the scope of California water rights that will ul ultimately be affected by that decision? It can be argued that expansive judicial treatment of both trust resources and trust uses suggest that the trust doctrine applies to groundwater rights, but no California court has so held. Um, sort of consistence with Rick's observation about does the public trust apply to this situation um, some interesting developments related to the November uh, 2009 water legislation package that we recently adopted here in California. Um, there were some earlier versions of the Pavley SB 229 bill uh, that had actually included certain language suggesting that all waters, including groundwaters in California, were subject uh, to public trust doctrine uh, and whatever flowed from that. Um, in response to this language, the California Groundwater Coalition and other groups, and, and Chris can speak to this later, uh, objected somewhat strenuously to this language in a letter sent in September 2009 and, and indicated that they would actually oppose SB 229 if that public trust language, that expansive public trust language, was included. Um, the language was ultimately removed from the final version that was passed in 2009. Uh, once again, sort of consistent, I think, with Rick Frank's observations uh, leaving the question of the application of the 
public trust doctrine to groundwater um, still somewhat unresolved. So, um, you know, looking at there's these three examples, uh, is there a, a common theme? Uh, I think the common theme that we can see is that rightly or wrongly, wisely or foolishly, private property conceptions of groundwater rights, particularly overlying groundwater rights, have persisted to a, a, a greater degree than they have with the case of riparian water rights, which I think helps to explain uh, some of the governance issues that we'll be uh, taking on in this panel. So with that set up, I will turn things over to Andy. And unlike with John Leshy, I'm gonna be sitting down here because we're gonna be doing more PowerPoint stuff. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna start with a general discussion of groundwater issues focusing uh, on uh, the interrelationship between groundwaters and surface waters before moving to the more uh, narrow issue of groundwater classification, which is important because the State Water Resources Control Board's permitting and licensing system for appropriations applies only to surface waters and to subterranean streams. Groundwater as a whole uh, is a major part of California's water supply, especially in dry and critically dry years where we increase our groundwater uh, appropriations or groundwater uses to make up for reductions in surface water supply. In an average water year, uh, about 30% of California's water use is <coughs> groundwater, but that goes uh, well up during uh, drought years. And that groundwater is not being managed. We have management systems for some basins, especially in so Southern California, but most of the California groundwater use is in the Central Valley, and that area is not managed. That's a microcosm of what you see west-wide. Of the 19 western states, 17 have state groundwater management programs, but most of the groundwater use in the west is in California, where we don't manage our groundwater. Now, just to be clear, I'm talking here about groundwater quantity. Groundwater quality is regulated under the Porter Cologne Water Quality Control Act administered by the State Water Board, and that applies to all waters, surface un and underground. And it's not just that we don't manage our groundwater. We don't know a lot of the things we need to know about our groundwater. Uh, the Department of Water Resources Bulletin 118, which is uh, one of the best sources of the information we do have, has identified 11 critically overdrafted basins with an estimated overdraft of one to two million acre feet per year. In 2009, the U.S. Geological Survey uh, did a study of the Central Valley uh, estimating uh, overdraft on the order of a million acre feet uh, per year over the last 50 years. Also in 2009, NASA came out with its own study, which estimated an overdraft of one to three million acre feet per year uh, since 2003 in the Central Valley. And that does not include 2009 when the groundwater pumping went way up and the groundwater recharge uh, went down. Groundwater surface water interactions are important to the effective management of our surface water resource, also important to the effective management uh, of our groundwater um, uh, resources. Um, and, but before going into some of the details on, on how groundwater and surface waters interact, I think it's important to recognize the differences between groundwater and surface water. This is groundwater. This is surface water. <laughs> Scientists recognize that um, they are a single interconnected resource. And the water moves back and forth. Uh, this is a simplified di diagram of uh, a gaining stream. Sometimes we call it a gaining reach, where the groundwater table is high enough that the groundwater is, is feeding uh, the surface stream. As the groundwater levels go down, you move to what we call a losing reach, where uh, the 
net effect is that the surface streams are recharging uh, the groundwater table. And then as the groundwater tables get further reduced, you have um, a disconnected um, stream. And as I said, different reaches of the same stream can be gaining or losing reaches. Also, the same reaches can change from gaining, to, from gaining reaches to losing reaches to disconnected reaches uh, between wet years and dry years. Now, the water code um, applies the State Water Resources Control Board's permanent licensing systems for appropriation of water to surface water and to subterranean streams in known and definite channels. So what, what is a subterranean stream? Uh, to the extent that anything comes to mind, what comes to mind to most people is water flowing through lava tubes or limestone caves or bridges or perhaps the subterranean reach of the Middle Fork American River. But what, what most, uh, what, what, this is a subterranean stream. What you're talking about, and if you think back to that earlier slide of, of, of groundwater, it's water moving through the alluvium, water moving underground in the soil, not something you can swim or raft uh, through. And, and this, is, this is the Carmel River, which has been determined to be a subterranean stream. But the subterranean stream is not just uh, the area below the sand in the immediate stream channel at this time when the stream's dry. This is a map of the Carmel River subterranean stream as determined uh, in the State Water Resources Control Board's Order 95-10, issued in 1995, uh, determining uh, that the uh, Carmel that the Carmel River or the Carmel Valley um, is a subterranean stream. A couple of things are noteworthy about this uh, slide. One, you can see uh, that although the subterranean stream is uh, much wider than the surface channel itself, it's still a relatively uh, narrow channel. It's about a half mile uh, from one side to the other. Um, the, the other thing I want to point out, if you can see them, are the black dots there along the river. Uh, those are wells. Uh, and there are two things that uh, are, you should take into account on those wells. One, notice how they are right next to the stream. Uh, that's the pattern we tend to see in these uh, subterranean stream cases. Um, the second thing that's probably more important is they're there. Okay, when the water board decided this was a subterranean stream, there were already a lot of wells there providing uh, water for municipal use. Uh, consider the consequences. Um, if you have a well in, in, a, in a groundwater basin, what we call percolating groundwater, that's not subject to the permitting system, you have a water right priority based on when you first used that water, let's say 1960. Then we decide in 1995, no, this is subject to the permit system. Well, your water pri right priority is going to be based on the, on the priority of the application you haven't filed yet, if you can get it approved at all. So maybe you'll get a 1995 priority. Well, there may not be water available for appropriation based on a 1995 priority. There might not be water based on a 1960 priority either, but this, this basin's not managed. Nobody's enforcing the law. You can sing well whether there's a right to take it or not. So, so you have people who have been relying on their belief they had priorities to groundwater or their belief no would ever enforce. Either way, they're going to be told they have to stop diverting when they've been relying uh, on their ability to divert. Uh, there have been actually relatively few cases defining what a subterranean stream is. The, most, the first one that really gives us clear definition from the State Water Board involved Garapata Creek, which as the slide shows, um, involved a fairly narrow band of alluvium, alluvium in a fairly narrow coastal canyon above bedrock. Uh, what's important about that is the board actually explained pretty much what a subterranean stream is before. It just said it was, and there's not much of an explanation, even though there had been a lot of permits issued uh, based on this authority. The board determined um, that the classification subterranean stream 
came from a 19th century water rights case called Los Angeles versus Pomeroy. After that, well, that's where the words subterranean stream and northern definite channels come from. Now, four years later, that became moot as a matter of common law because, as Paul said, the difference between the law of capture was abandoned, and so the rights for, for riparians and overlying uses became the same. So for the purposes of the common law, it was no longer important what was surface or groundwater. It's just like our Porter Cologne Act. The same rules are basically the same ones apply. But the court case in Pomeroy used that. We concluded that's what the legislature meant when they adopted the same words. And we adopted what I'd call kind of overlapping four-part test. There must be a channel. It must be relatively impermeable bed and banks. The, it must be known and capable of being known on the groundwater must be flowing in the channel. The next major case was the Palma Paula basins, where two lower basins in the same uh, river, the San Luis Rey River, had been determined to be subterranean streams, and then the issue came whether the upstream uh, channels were subterranean streams. This raised a firestorm of controversy. The argument being made is, oh no, the board's expanding its jurisdiction. And in some ways, this did raise a more difficult case because here we're talking about a stream channel as wide as two miles. Um, the, the charge kind of nonplussed us. One, because we weren't trying to expand our jurisdiction. We were following this archaic old 1899 case. And second, many of the opponents raised an alternative, what they called an impact test, which had us scratching our tits because we thought that would be a broader test uh, of what we could reach. But the board um, hired uh, Professor Sachs from the University of California at, D at Berkeley uh, to perform a study, and he um, came up with some very interesting analysis of the case law and the history of the Water Commission Act, which there's not time to cover here, but it is in the written materials. And he recommended an impact test, where, um, the, where based on the impact, the, the water board uh, would, and instead of the old Pomeroy bed and banks test, based on the impact, the water board would assert permitting authority uh, over streams. Now, the board went to public workshop on this, but even before the board workshop started, the board announced, no, we're not taking the Sachs test. Um, and we eventually, as I'll get to, went back to the bed and banks. Um, the, the Sachs report did have this advantage, as all the people who had been screaming that following this Pomeroy uh, Garapata test is, is expanding the board jurisdictions, when they saw Professor Sachs was endorsing an impact test, they abandoned the impact test and went back to say, no, go to bed and banks. Uh, the next, and I'm, I'll finish this up quickly, the next um, state water board proceeding on this uh, involves the North Fork Wallala River, again, as this aerial photo shows, a relatively narrow coastal stream with alluvium in the bottom. We followed the four-part um, Pomeroy Garapata test. Uh, we were uh, challenged and upheld in the Court of Appeal, upholding the use of the four-part uh, pomeroy garapata test um, and rejecting arguments that were to, would try to narrow the, the test. Uh, in conclusion, where that leaves us, in my opinion, is any window of opportunity that there may have been to adopt some different test, as might have been recommended by uh, Professor Sachs or another way, that window has closed. Uh, unless uh, the legisla legislature wants to do something, and I can say they're definitely not going to be doing anything. So we're going to be continuing to use this um, arcane, archaic uh, test. Uh, one closing thought is um, Professor Sachs also rec rec recognized that even his test would not be adequate to deal with all of the interactions between surface water and groundwater. He recommended use of the State Water Board's authority to prevent waste or unreasonable use under Water Code Section 275, which is in a different part of the Water Code and is not limited by the definitions limiting to underground streams and known indefinite channels. So it definitely does apply to groundwater. In my opinion, though, it doesn't provide a workable way of dealing with such a large problem with so many individual diversions. Um, thank you, Andy. Just so you know, we're going to hold questions uh, until after uh, 
after Kevin's presentation so we can have them focus on this first subsection. Hey, Kevin. Thank you. I have uh, spent a pretty good chunk of my uh, professional career disagreeing with Andy Sawyer on different, uh, different issues. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to start off with, uh, with a disagreement with one of his statements, uh, and, and this is offered respectfully, Andy. But uh, Andy started his remarks by saying that uh, we don't manage groundwater in California. Uh, I, I think the more accurate statement is we don't manage groundwater in California through a centralized uh, state system. We manage groundwater locally. And in some local areas, I think we manage groundwater very effectively. For example, uh, I think the Sacramento Valley manages its groundwater effectively. I think the Santa Clara Valley near here manages its groundwater effectively. I think the Salinas Valley, although it has a, a, some difficult problems with seawater intrusion, is on the path of managing its groundwater effectively. Uh, and there certainly are areas of the state where we do not manage groundwater effectively. And there are areas with very severe overdraft problems and I don't want to minimize that. But I also don't want to uh, forget about the success stories uh, because there are some. Uh, what I'm going to do is focus a little more uh, specifically on the North Guallala decision uh, because I think uh, in this area of the law in particular, uh, really kind of drilling down uh, in, in, into the facts, no pun intended, is, is really important in terms of understanding how the law is going to apply in a particular situation. Uh, this area of the law has uh, sort of some fondness for me because uh, when I came out to California in 1985, uh, having practiced in Colorado for three years, uh, the very first file that I was handed by uh, the senior partner in our firm, George Basie, was a, a subterranean stream flow case that arose in a uh, stream adjudication that was happening about 30 miles south of here on San Gregorio Creek. Uh, and my client in that proceeding happened to be uh, Neil Young, who has a uh, ranch on that creek, which was pretty cool, you know, my first, uh, my first <laughs> client. And, you know, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking, wow, this is good. Who's my next client? Uh, Mick Jagger, you know? And, but uh, so uh, my job was to try to figure out, with respect to certain groundwater uses, uh, were those subject to the state board's jurisdiction in this, in this stream adjudication or were they outside the state board's jurisdiction? And having practiced in Colorado for long enough to at least have a general understanding of how they treated these issues out there, uh, I, I was quite surprised to learn that in California there's this subterranean stream flow concept and that uh, uh, notions that had been followed in Colorado since the 60s of basically they divide their groundwater between so-called tributary and non-tributary groundwater for pur purposes of regulation. We didn't do any of that here in California. Uh, so I, I dug into the case law and, and there were a number of uh, the Pomeroy case and a lot of those old cases and some state board decisions uh, and emerged from about probably two, three weeks of research completely confused. <laughs> now, I mean totally confused. <coughs> I mean, to the point where I remember having a conversation with my, my then girlfriend, now wife, saying, I'm not sure I can do this. <laughs> I'm not sure that I have the technical expertise to really, uh, to be able to, to, to practice in this area. And what I, what I came to learn over the course of many years, and this ties into some language I'm gonna, we're gonna look at it from the uh, North Koalala case, is this area really is, uh, uh, has sort of an Alice in Wonderland quality to it. And, uh, and that stems from the fact that we are attempting to apply uh, scientific concepts, subterranean stream flow, which were adopted in the early 1900s, even the late 1800s, in a context today where we have scientific tools that tell us that that's really not the, the geologic uh, sort of uh, conceptual framework in which we are really working. So that, that is the challenge in this particular area. So let's just uh, turn to uh, quickly, you're going to go through some uh, slides from the North Koalala case. Now, these are actually uh, trial exhibits from the North Koalala uh, hearing that was held in front of the water board. Uh, these were the uh, companies 
uh, exhibits. So this is just a location map. I think many of you probably know where Gallala is, up on the border between Mendocino and Sonoma County. Uh, this is the location of the, of the wells that were at issue in this case. There were two production wells, PW4 and 5. They were both located about 200 feet from the Gualala River, producing groundwater, or producing water uh, from, uh, uh, one from 50 feet uh, below the surface and one 150 feet. And so the issue in this case was whether those wells were producing uh, percolating groundwater or subterranean stream flow throwing flowing through a known and definite channel, which is the language under Water Code Section 1200. Now the key issue, uh, at least in my opinion, in this, in this case uh, had to do with the issue of the direction of the flow. And if you'll recall the four-part test that Andy talked about, um, which is discussed at length in the North Gualala case, one of the elements of that test is that the subterranean water must be flowing. And the question that uh, was grappled with in the North Gualala case is, does that mean it has to be flowing in the direction of the stream, or does it just need to be flowing? And for those of you who have technical backgrounds, you know that basically all groundwater is flowing. Groundwater flows from areas of higher elevation to lower elevation. It's called gravity. And so if the, if, the, if the requirement is simply that groundwater be flowing, then it's really no requirement at all. So the, the issue that was really grappled with extensively in North Gualala was, okay, what does that element mean in this particular factual context? And what we had here was we had, and, and uh, probably most of you know how to read a contour map, basically the groundwater is flowing in a north to south direction here in the vicinity of the two production wells. There's one of the production wells, the other one's right there. And so the argument that was made uh, by the, the company that operated the wells was that this flow direction in the vicinity of the wells is really not associated with the flow of the North Gualala River. And the, their expert testified that the water uh, that was coming through and that the wells were producing was actually, uh, in the, in the wintertime, was water that was percolating from precipitation coming down through here, and then in the summertime, water that had uh, recharged the fractured uh, rock, impermeable rock up here, and then was seeping out in the summertime, and that it really wasn't associated with the river. The Department of Fish and Game had an expert that came up with a legal theory, or a, a technical theory, uh, that I have to confess I don't completely understand, but the, the gist of it, based on the, the case and, and other things I've read, is that uh, up here, the water was flowing in an east-west direction, but there was a, an impermeable clay layer that forced the water to flow south here and that just because it was flowing south in the vicinity of the wells didn't mean that it wasn't really associated with the flow of the, of the river. And so that was the factual setting in which the North Gualala Court, and this is the first appellate case ever interpreting Water Code Section 1200, the subterranean stream flow standard. So this is a very important case. And, and, and frankly, it, it's, it's a, although I don't necessarily agree with all of the analysis and the opinion, it's a, it's a very uh, scholarly and, and well-written opinion, and I, I commend it to those of you who are interested in this area of the law. Uh, but the, the, the really the key issue in my mind in the case became how much deference was the court going to give to the State Water Board and its staff in relation to uh, its determination as to this flow issue. And ultimately what happened was the board uh, adopted a decision that uh, that essentially said that in this particular uh, situation, the, the flow met the flow requirement of the four-part test, even though it wasn't uh, in the direction of the river, uh, because of this theory that the Department of Fish and Game expert had put forth, that uh, we had sort of a unique uh, set of geologic circumstances here. And so the question, one of the key questions was, uh, what is the Court of Appeal going to do with that? Uh, 
And you know, this gets into standard of review. For those of you who practice administrative law, you know that standard of review is a very, very important uh, concept and, and really often uh, determines the difference between winning and losing a case when you're, when you're challenging an administrative agency. And in this case, the, the, the court said two things. It said, number one, as to the board's interpretation of Water Code Section 1200, we're only going to give that limited deference. Uh, we're not going to, because it's an interpretation of a statute, we can do that as well as the board. The board has special expertise, but we're not going to give it uh, unbridled deference. Uh, it, it said that, and then, uh, in, in my mind anyway, it, it then agreed with essentially the board's interpretation of the statute. So you sort of have a mixed bag on that issue. And then on the question of the factual findings, and, th and this was kind of the key to the case, the, the Court uh, of Appeal said uh, this is a substantial evidence case, and even though we might have come to a, a different conclusion than the board, uh, looking at the evidence, and, and this, these uh, slides are some of the key evidence, uh, we're not going to substitute our uh, uh, decision making for the boards as to the interpretation of the technical evidence. The board found that it met the third requirement of the four-part test, we're going, to, uh, we're going to defer to that, we're going to uphold it because there was substantial evidence in the record to support that finding, namely the decision of, or the uh, opinion of the Department of Fish and Game expert. So um, ultimately we have a situation I think where uh, as a practical matter I think the courts will defer quite a bit to the board in issues of this type. And as we move forward now, the question really becomes, the application of the North Guadalala uh, test, which has now been uh, proved by the courts in other factual settings. And the issue that comes up, and which was discussed at length by Professor Sachs in his report, is whether, is whether this, uh, situation, I'm going to just going to skip ahead here. He says, the central controversy over the scope of subterranean stream in the statute centers on whether the board is likely to take jurisdiction over groundwater pumping in broad alluvial valleys where it has not ordinarily exercised its jurisdiction in the past, such as the Sacramento Valley, such as the Salinas Valley. It's a very, very significant issue in terms of the administration of water rights in the state. And then Professor Sachs went on to state uh, talking about uh, a couple of the elements of the uh, four-part test, and you see at the end he says, on the other hand, if a channel can be quite broad and unfurl-like, so long as it is enclosed by relatively impermeable beds and banks, subterranean stream jurisdiction could be quite extensive. Now, this, was, this report was done before the North Guadalajara case, but I, I, I'm not convinced that there was anything in North Guadalajara that really uh, necessarily changes uh, Professor Sachs's uh, statement in that regard. And so uh, the, really the, the key question I think going forward uh, is how aggressive uh, the State Board may be in taking what it now has, a fairly clear statement of the law and also a fairly clear statement of, of deference, uh, and applying uh, applying that to other uh, factual contexts and, and really expanding its jurisdiction over groundwater. Uh, I was pleased to hear Andy say that, uh, that this is going to be uh, the law, that we're not going to go back and talk about impacts tests, but nonetheless, I think the, the question of how far the board might go with this particular uh, ruling uh, is going to be, I think, a very important one going forward. Thank you. So we've got about uh, 10 minutes for questions. I'm going to uh, exercise moderator's prerogative and ask the first one, which kind of uh, draws on comments uh, both that Andy made and that Kevin made. Um, one thing that Andy noted in his presentation was that the majority of states in the West, uh, in contrast to California, do have state regulation over groundwater pumping. So we've taken a different approach, uh, just sort of acknowledging that. Uh, and then Kevin clarified that while we may not have groundwater regulation at the state level, at least in terms of uh, groundwater pumping restrictions, uh, 
we do often try to manage it locally. So one question I have, and I'll leave it to either of you or, or anyone else on the panel to take on, is when you compare uh, the results, uh, let's just focus the results being preventing overdraft, uh, between California versus some of the other states in the West, um, has California's system of relying on local regulation worked better or worse than many of the states in the West that have moved towards state regulation? I don't think there's any state, Western state, that's worse or, or even close to as bad. Now, Kevin and I, I think, don't disagree as strongly as it, as it may have sounded. There are some groundwater basins that are managed locally, and they are preventing long-term overdraft, no doubt about that. There are others that may not need to be managed or only need to be managed to deal with things like conjunctive use. They will not overdraft no matter how much they're pumped. And then there are the basins where most of the pumping is going and they're not regulated at all and they're in critical overdraft. Um, seldom, if ever, is groundwater managed to deal with impacts on surface waters. That's, they're just managed to protect the groundwater use. They're not managed to protect the surface flows. And in fact, that's basically what safe yield is. Steal as much as possible from the surface flows without stealing from each other. That's what groundwater management is, where it's occurring in California. Other panels can take a crack at it, or if not, I'll I think I think some people use management and regulation interchangeably, and others don't. And I think that that's the heart of the issue. I think that groundwater management occurs in many parts of the state, and I'm going to uh, talk about my group and my comments. But I think the question of whether management is needed, the answer is unequivocally yes. Um, is state regulation needed? I think you're going to find a wide variety of opinions, and I think that um, many ideas that come and go in the legislature could actually be much more destructive than helpful when it comes to trying to manage this local resource. Um, the second comment I would make just in terms of comparisons, usually whenever you're saying is it done better in California or somewhere else, our legislature for the most part I think we're just different and, uh, <laughs> and we're going to do things our own way and I think this is another area where we've done so. Just, I just wanted to add one comment. Uh, w one of the things that's happening in California is uh, a trend, I think a fairly strong trend, towards adjudication of basins. Um, if you look historically, uh, I think there had been about 16 basins adjudicated uh, before uh, 10 years or so ago. There have been three major adjudications uh, undertaken, uh, one of which is still underway in Antelope Valley. Uh, actually, I've worked with Chris's firm on a, a number of those. and. Um, you know, you can debate whether that's a good thing or not. Um, it's certainly an expensive process, but at the end of the day, uh, you do have a, a judge and typically a water master that has a pretty, pretty strict control over that basin. And I think uh, absent something happening at a state level, I think we're going to continue to see uh, more and more groundwater adjudications. So let's open it up uh, to questions either from the panelists or from the audience. Um, Blue, yes. You can use the microphone. I should too. I'm really surprised there hasn't been more adjudication throughout the state of California. Who? I just I don't understand why, why there hasn't been. Is is there? Do you have to bring a lawsuit on a groundwater basin in order for it to happen? Yes, for um, the, for surface waters there two ways of doing an adjudication. One is starting with a lawsuit in court. The other is starting with an administrative proceeding before the State Water Resources Control Board, which ultimately leads to a court decree. For groundwater, you have only the option of going to court. Um, the, the best materials, I recite these in my written materials here, the Governor's Commission to Review California Water Rights Law that Hap Dunning chaired the, the legal work on. Uh, provides a good description of why adjudications are going to be extremely difficult for these very large uh, basins. That the adjudications we have seen, first of all, adjudications go up in complication exponentially as you get more parties, and groundwater will be much harder to regulate than surface water because there are many more wells, and these groundwater adjudications are going to have a huge number of parties. Second, the adjudications that have occurred 
have, unlike surface water adjudications, surface water adjudications would go through and make an individualized determination of everybody's water rights. Groundwater adjudications of almost uniformly, so far as I know uniformly, ended by settlement. And settlement is usually based on some simplified formula to decide how much everybody can pump rather than an individualized determination of what people's rights are. And those simplified formulas at one time bore a fairly close relationship to what some people thought the law was. And the California Supreme Court has systematically overturned all those legal theories. So it's, it's getting harder legally to adjudicate. And, we're, we've, we've, and, we're, and, the one, and the basins that need it most are going to be the most complex anyway. Well, can I, I'd like sure. to add on to that. Um, I think the fact that they're getting, becoming more difficult doesn't mean that it's not still the best solution. Um, and this goes to the issue again of whether there are rights involved or, not, or whether there aren't rights. Ultimately, uh, legal rights need to be determined by a court of law. I think that there are lots of ways that we could look at streamlining adjudications, but the notion, and I know that some legislators from time to time have the idea that we could just start doing things differently um, tomorrow. Uh, it doesn't work that way. These legal rights are important. They are, there's reliance on legal rights, whether it be for agricultural usage, whether it be to serve water ratepayers. Uh, these legal rights are very important, and I was going to say when I started my piece that you might not know that really the whole underlying current, I think, of our panel really is this tension between the public trust and the legal rights that are associated with groundwater. That's very fundamental, but people who have those rights are simply not going to let go of those rights without a fight. Uh, they're valuable, they're necessary, and my answer to your question in terms of why, why does it seem like there's more activity, um, as a former member of, of uh, both San Diego County Water Authority and the Metropolitan Water District uh, Board of Directors, we were all about importing water. Uh, 20 years ago when I was on the Met Board, nobody ever even talked about groundwater. But today, uh, conjunctive use is the, is the wave of the future. Somebody mentioned earlier we're going to have water three out of ten years. Well, we've got to be able to store that water. And with, the, um, with, with a strong community of interest not supporting more surface storage reservoirs, this necessarily means that we're going to be combining our imported and surface water supplies with groundwater. But uh, ultimately, uh, adjudications bring legal certainty. They're a good thing. We could probably do some things to shorten the process. So let, let's go to a couple more questions. Just to, to follow up on Andy's point when he was talking about the California Supreme Court 2000 case, um, City of Barstow versus Mojave, Mojave Water Agency, which held that a court couldn't disregard paramount overlying rights uh, in creating a physical solution. And I think that's that holding is sort of what's created some of the complications and goes into some of the comments from Chris. So let's uh, take a couple more questions. Uh, you, you had your hand up in the yeah. back for a while. Uh, notwithstanding what Andy just said, and I was actually holding this question until uh, Dennis and Chris spoke, isn't it possible that SB6 is act could actually stimulate some momentum for uh, 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 more fully adjudicated basins throughout, uh, further throughout the state? Um, and I was talking to Dennis with this, about this at lunch, and he kind of created a set of circumstances that it, that could actually happen. But uh, and I want Andy to actually hear that and then see what he has to say now. <laughs> actually, I wanted to pick up on something Chris said because I, I think we're in agreement. Is uh, I, I would prefer that groundwater be managed in a right way that respects people's rights as much as possible. The problem is you can't determine what people's rights are, especially appropriative rights, without accurate records of how much they've been pumping over time. And except in five Southern California San counties, there is no reporting of groundwater pumping. So we do not have the information to come very close to an appropriation, to a, an adjudication that respects appropriative water rights. And SB 7A6 doesn't give you that. It doesn't give you the pumping records. It doesn't give you the ability to determine individual rights. It just tells, gives you groundwater levels. Yes, it's progress, but it's nowhere near what we need to actually be able to adjudicate these basins. Let's take two more can questions from can the I, oh, Can I just quick comment. quickly respond to that? 
I've been involved in three groundwater adjudications. None of them involve situations where the pumpers measured their, their wells. And it is not a difficult task for engineers to take cropping records and crop maps, of which there are plenty from Department of Water Resources, and from that data uh, come up with very, very good estimates of groundwater pumping. It's just simply not that difficult. It's done all the time. So I, this notion that we don't have a good handle on how much groundwater is pumped, I think we have a very good handle on it. And certainly when, it's, when we need that information, we're able to develop it very quickly. Let me jump in on this, even though <coughs> I'm probably going to talk a little bit more. Well, I will, be, I will talk more about this. <coughs> My observation in the water world is that you all are very good at looking out for your own best interest when you know what that interest is. With groundwater, in much of the state, we have sort of a don't ask, don't tell approach, okay? We don't really know what's going on with in, in many, many, many of our groundwater basins. We don't really know what's going on. And so a, an individual pumper might think they're being screwed, but they're not sure enough to actually, you know, make them go down to court. If we have monitoring of groundwater elevations and the data becomes freely and widely available as per the, the bill, people are going to be able to tell better whether or not they're getting screwed. That's likely to trigger uh, uh, adjudications. That's a full employment act. For all this. Okay. Let's take two more questions. Uh, cynical view, but probably accurate. Um, two from the public, and then we'll, we're already behind time-wise. So. Wait, at a law school, that's not a cynical view. <laughs> it's my job. <laughs> Okay, I think, Andy, this uh, question is more directed towards you. It's kind of like a three-parter. Um, I'm talking, well, actually, first I want to make a comment That's for what Kevin just said. We may have information about groundwater pumping, but a lot of that information actually isn't available to the public or decipherable to the public, so it makes, you know, citizen enforcement such things or bringing, you know, actions to the water board's attention sort of difficult. But, um, so, Andy, I sort of want to talk about percolating groundwater when it's a, uh, hydrologically connected with surface flows. And is it possible that the fact that you don't really regulate or permit percolating groundwater as part of the State Water Board's authority, um, does that affect your ability to then permit or regulate or manage surface flows um, in that respect? Um, and if so, couldn't one argue that over your overarching regulatory authority over all waters, you could then act in those circumstances, especially in light of the public trust duties employed on the state? Sorry, long question. In 30 seconds. Yeah, and I only caught two of the three parts, so I'll only answer two of the parts. Of course, uh, lack of information, lack of regulatory authority, assess, et cetera, over percolating groundwater affects our authority. When we permit water rights, we have to respect prior, prior right, water rights. When we allow changes, we have to avoid injury, and that includes no injury to groundwater users. So we have to make sure we're not interfering with recharge and things like that. And a lack of adequate information makes it more difficult for us to do our job of protecting uh, the groundwater rights when we administer the surface water rights. Similarly, um, you have examples, and we have it in the Shafts, in the Scott adjudications, where um, people uh, don't like the, sur the surface water regulation, so they just put in a well one foot away from where they'd be subject to the, the, the regulations that apply to the surface water. So it gets very difficult to um, regulate a part of a combined resource when you're not um, touching the, oth the, uh, the other parts. Not so difficult you can't do it, but it makes it difficult, especially on these, these smaller streams. But trying to use the tools we have, like waste and unreasonable use authority, to get after it when, you, when groundwater is a very large number of very small diversions really is not workable, not with 10 times our current staff. We need to have active management. Uh, and, to, and to close, that's the big issue, not is it managed locally or is it managed by the state, but is it managed? Andy's going to be surprised to hear me bring this up, but I, I, I do think one of the really interesting issues in California water law is the question of whether the public trust doctrine provides a basis for uh, regulation of groundwater pumping. It's an issue that hasn't been litigated. Um, Richard Bruce Collins, who was here earlier, uh, actually filed a complaint with the Water Board about 10 years ago uh, alleging that pumping that was occurring in the vicinity of Lake Merced uh, south of here uh, 
was uh, uh, basically violating the public trust, uh, we have since uh, gone down the road of settlement of that, that dispute, but uh, it's a live issue and it's a, it, I suspect at some point in the future it's gonna be a very important issue. One last question uh, on this panel, then we'll need to move forward already about 20 oh, minutes. Yeah, like you said, Kevin, if you follow the thinking uh, that was set forth in Audubon, wouldn't it really depend on whether the groundwater is tributary to a navigable water? People are talking about it as if, okay, groundwater is or is not subject to the public trust doctrine. I would say it depends on what kind of groundwater you're talking about. At least if the Audubon reasoning is to be followed. Now, Hawaii does it much more broadly, but that's another jurisdiction. I guess that what I would say to that, Hap, is uh, just so that I don't see myself quoted in some declaration at some point in the future, that uh, I certainly think that the case is stronger if you're dealing with a, a situation where the, the water, the groundwater that's being pumped is directly connected hydraulically to a, to a, to a live stream. If I can follow up on that, I mean, I think the public trust doctrine applies to diversion of non-navigable waters to the extent they affect public trust uses in navigable waters. It's a common law doctrine. It's not going to make a difference between surface and groundwater if you have that impact on surface waters. But we have the same authority under Water Code Section 275 to deal with interconnections that affect surface waters. So the public trust, to my mind, doesn't add a lot. The problem is it's, it's, a, it's a doctrine that can be used in individual cases, but try to deal in an organized manner with thousands of wells, uh, you need a better structure. So thank you for that comment, Hap. I think it points out that while Joe Sachs's argument may have been rejected uh, in the permitting context of the State Water Board, it, there's the possibility of maybe some traction on the enforcement side uh, when we think about uh, the public trust. Okay, so with that, we're going to move on to a uh, discussion about the new uh, DWR reporting requirements, and we'll start with Dennis. You know, I think I'm just going to stay here since I only have one slide, and in a second, in a second, I'll ask you to put it up. Okay. Okay. So um, <laughs> they gave me all kinds of heck when we were talking on a conference call earlier about how I didn't have any PowerPoint slides. So I said, okay, try this, and they immediately said, yes, we need to use it. So that's the backstory on that. Um, first, I need to start off with my disclaimer. Uh, my remarks are my opinion. They do not necessarily reflect those of our chair, Senator Pavley, our vice chair, Senator Cogdell, any of the other members of our committee, any of my previous chairs, Senator Steinberg, <laughs> Kuhl, Machado, and my wife wants to make it absolutely clear that I never speak for her. Um, so we're going to put it up. Okay. So I, uh, give, give me just a second. I'll, I'll, I'll point to you. Okay, I was asked to talk about both the policy and the politics of getting uh, Senate Bill uh, 7X6 uh, signed. Uh, this has been a five-year saga, for, for at least for me. Um, each year, or each cycle we've gone through this, uh, there has been a separate policy debate and then a political debate and then it would sort of iterate through, and then we would leave off someplace, either in the middle of a policy debate or in the middle of a political debate, and then when, when you know, things happen, we would just sort of pick up. There's two take-home messages for y'all. First off, at least in groundwater, the starting point for negotiation was not existing law as it's generally understood. Um, rather, it was what the various interests thought it, existing law ought to be. And as you can imagine, in groundwater, there are lots of ideas what people think the groundwater law ought to be. And then the, the other take home message is that the, the, the quest for groundwater legislation was a quest for a signature from the governor. Uh, I was able to deliver uh, bills to his desk with the help of my, my chairs um, three times, and vetoed three times. In this particular case, the fourth time was charmed. And so that, that, that brings to mind then this slide. Um, I, uh, this is a cartoonist from Australia who um, has done a remarkable job in, in uh, documenting uh, the various problems in what Australia has been having in dealing with its water uh, things. Um, if, for those of you who can't read it, the, the, the person's asking the, the uh, politician, what's your water policy? And the politician responds, take some water, mix it with a bit of dirt, and sling it at opposing politicians. 
uh, I will decline the opportunity to identify who I think that uh, cartoon represents. So, how did we get started on this? Five years ago, Sen uh, the Senate suddenly realized that water was a natural resource, and so they moved it from the Senate Ag and Water Committee into the Senate Natural Resources and Water Committee. So Senator Kuehl was the, ex was the then existing chair of the Senate Natural Resources Committee, and she got water, and so her level of interest in water suddenly rose sharply. Uh, so she asked for, and I gave her a series of, of uh, two hour long briefings on various aspects of water. Uh, basic hydrology, the history, who the various players are and their concerns, basic water rights law, um, and then various current issues and such. Um, the la then we had a, a, a meeting where she said, okay, so what should we do? And we sort of walked through all the various issues that we had talked about the, the session before. And she says, how would we fix each one of these things? And I suggested some options, and she said, fine, let's do all of that. <laughs> and then she said, so is there any, besides all that, is there anything provocative we can do? And I made a suggestion, and she said, great. Um, so that resulted in, in Senate Bill 820. Uh, uh, she wanted to have a good number, and so 820, H2O, anyway. Um, <laughs> I've always found the concept of good bill numbers somewhat baffling, but, but, but there you go. Um, the initial bill had many, many, many contentious issues. For example, it would have established beginning in 2011 that a rebuttable presumption of waste would arise whenever any person failed to implement cost-effective water conservation practices as defined. It would have made the preparation and adoption of urban water management plans subject to CEQA since water uh, supply reliability assessments have to be made as part of the, what are known as the show us the water laws, and there was never any sort of a public review or certification of those things, the thought was, you know, that would give you sort of a CEQA background. The bill would have required the executive director of the state water board to establish and maintain and publish a list of stream systems that would be candidates for being on a fully uh, appropriated list. Um, and then it also then expanded uh, what's known as the recordation program uh, in Southern California. Since the 50s, in, in five counties, it's been required that anyone who extracts 25 acre feet of, of groundwater or more in a year needed to report that to the state board. This bill would have expanded the recordation program statewide. Um, the immediate uh, negotiations on the bill were dealing with the more contentious issues. We dropped the rebuttable presumption of waste, we dropped the sequel requirement uh, uh, for urban water management plans, and got rid of the, uh, the maintenance of a candidate list for full, fully appropriated streams. And with that, the bill passed out of the Senate without any, any problems. In the, in the assembly, we started dealing with the groundwater issues, and the groundwater management agencies, of which we do have a number of that do do good jobs, came and said, look, we're doing a good job. We can show you we're doing a good job. Can our areas become exempt from the, the expansion of the recordation program? We said, fine, because the real objective is to get better groundwater management, not just generating data. Uh, and so we made that change. Um, and then we ran into um, the political buzzsaw. So we would sort of worked out sort of the policy stuff. The political buzz saw, um, this will come as a shock to you, but my friends in the agricultural community did not generally see the wisdom of this bill. Um, they were concerned about the groundwater provisions and the requirement for ag water management plans. Those were both two contentious issues. Um, on the groundwater things, the various issues that tended to be brought up was, or objections was, groundwater is not a public trust resource. Well, it may be, it may not be, the courts actually haven't told us. And besides that, it doesn't have to be a public trust resource for the state to get involved in, in regulation and management of any public resource. Um, groundwater is a property right. Well, yeah, it's a use right. You don't actually own the corpus of the water. Um, and so, you know, there, there, are, there are those sorts of things. So it was suggested that, well, my use of the groundwater is proprietary information because if I'm a farmer and people know how much <coughs> water I'm extracting, they can figure out how I'm doing my, my stuff. So there were, those were the kinds of, of, of issues that we were dealing with. And because we had a number of agricultural representatives from the Democratic Party on that committee, I needed to find some Republican votes. Uh, and so um, uh, then Assembly Member Lynn Dauscher from Brea, uh, who's 
lives in Orange County, very well managed groundwater basin, not adjudicated, just they just decided to do it. Um, was concerned about you know reporting penalties and stuff, so we made some minor adjustments on that. And long story short, uh, uh, we got Aqua, to the Association of California Water Agencies. They went neutral on the bill, um, and the bill passed both houses. Now, here's some con context. While Aqua was officially neutral, it was not because they were indifferent. It was because they were split. The urban agencies thought this is a good idea. We're doing this. Everybody should, generally speaking. The agricultural communities, generally speaking, said no, 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 no. Um, and uh, because of the, the relationship between the agricultural community and the Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Commerce was opposed and there was a long line of folks going into the governor's office. Long story short, the bill was vetoed. Um, next year, tried again. Uh, the identical bill that was vetoed, except instead of having the recordation, expanding the recordation program, we set up a whole process for uh, developing uh, groundwater elevation reporting. We spent a lot of time working with the various groundwater management agencies and uh, laying out exactly so who would be, the, the, what's the hierarchy of who would do things, you know, like, uh, Judy, you know court appointed, uh, court, court appointed um, uh, water masters first, statutorily uh, defined uh, water management agencies next, so on and so forth. Uh, long story short, vetoed again. Uh, Senator Steinberg came in, said, let's keep going, um, and said, let's see if we can get the Farm Bureau neutral. Maybe that will help. So, spent a long time, started off with where we left off before, worked through the stuff, worked with our friends in the Farm Bureau, came up with some, some amendments that uh, moved the Farm Bureau from opposed to neutral. Um, these were, uh, the previous version of the bill said that, um, that uh, if, if nobody wanted to monitor the groundwater elevations, DWR would come in, establish a monitoring district, and charge the well owners for the cost of, of monitoring. Uh, that was dropped. Uh, we made it, added amendments to make it clear that it doesn't change any other groundwater laws except as expressly uh, set forth in the bill, even though that's the way that it works, that, they, that was important. And then we also added amendments that would allow any well owner to submit data as well. The, the Farm Bureau went neutral with that. Uh, also, uh, the Sierra Club went from support to neutral because they thought it, it went from a mandatory to a uh, voluntary. Um, long story short, governor vetoed it. Now here's the context on that. The governor really wanted to have a water bond. His water bond had to have uh, a surface storage in it. Uh, Senator Parada did not want to give him a water bond with, with surface storage in it that was continuously appropriated where the legislature would have no say. Um, so the, 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 the second two vetoes I submit were really because the bill was being hostage, being held hostage by the governor. He didn't get what he wanted, so we weren't going to get what we wanted. Uh, Senator, so, so why did it get signed this time? Because it is, is largely similar to uh, the bill that, that Senator Steinberg had uh, um, that got vetoed. The big thing was is that the governor got what he wanted. He wanted a water bond that had wa money in it for surface storage. He got it. Uh, the, 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 uh, that was, it was in part of the water package because you needed to have the groundwater stuff to hold the environmental support. Other, you know, you lose the groundwater, you, loo you loo lost a lot of support from the environment. You need two thirds for a, for, for a bond. Long story short, it was a political deal at the end on things unrelated to groundwater management that was the key to getting that bill through. Um, I think I'll, I mean, I have some thoughts on how it'll help and all that stuff, but we can talk about that under questions. Thank you, Dennis. Chris. discussion today about political will and uh, you know Dennis is right um, it's a very complicated process in the Capitol and uh, I believe you, you often hear the phrase that well this didn't get done because the political will was lacking and uh, I always say that that's somebody's agenda because whatever got done is exactly what the political will was at any given point in time 
And Dennis is right, looking at this particular bill, the groundwater monitoring provision, I think we had a very strong constituency of interest that were supportive of it, but somewhere along the road, it got caught up in a much bigger dynamic, and that larger dynamic was really defining where the political will was at that time. So the political will, in fact, does always determine what happens. Uh, in this particular uh, issue, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've got an undercurrent here of a tension between um, uh, the public good, water as a natural resource, and rights. Uh, that's not going to go away. That's going to continue to be a very important part of the pol political dynamic. And as we look forward to solutions uh, in the future, including how this groundwater monitoring bill is going to play out, um, I think we're going to see those same tensions at the table. Uh, there's been a lot of talk today about uh, evolution, and there was one issue that was touched upon a little bit in the very last uh, section, but I wanted to just take uh, maybe 30 seconds on it, and that is the question of uh, cost and water rates. Um, a lot of the uh, evolution of how this natural resource, whether we're talking about groundwater, surface water, uh, and the environment generally, has evolved over the past 20 years. And I believe that we're in a critical period now where we're going to see another very important part of the um, evolution of how these issues are dealt with at the political level. Uh, Jason made the, the reference earlier to some of the, you know, really significant challenges that are occurring in some of the agricultural sector. But if we look at through Southern California, uh, those same pressures are knocking at the door. And I think they're knocking at the door throughout the state. And the, the bad news is, uh, it comes at a time when we are extremely water short. It comes at a time when the economy uh, is really struggling. Uh, but the good news is I think that's going to be a driver uh, to, to really force people to work together in a way that they have not uh, maybe previously done. Uh, so uh, I think as we look to the future, whether it's looking at this groundwater monitoring provision uh, or these are what I consider some of these mind-numbing um, issues that come up looking at what is the best way to, to manage groundwater. I think we're going to see a different kind of future and I think it's going to be very much driven by costs, by rates, and by pressures that are going to be placed on a lot of our elected officials, whether they are elected to a local water board or whether they're elected to the legislature. Uh, I believe that the ratepayers will be heard and I think that's going to become a very significant force. Um, I want to just uh, quickly, I think I was invited here in part uh, because of my representation of, of two groups that were uh, very supportive of the groundwater monitoring bill. Uh, one is the Groundwater Resources Association, and there's been some reference earlier today about the, the importance of technical information. Uh, Tim Parker, my legislative committee chair, is here somewhere, and he, uh, uh, we, we brought that to the table, and I have to tell you in the legislature, the amount of knowledge um, about groundwater is, I think, pretty low. I mean, it's just really complicated. Uh, I have to say, when I was invited to this panel, Al, standing up, yeah, you're going to get your shout out in a minute, uh, that, that it, it, is, it is, when I first got the invitation, I went back to read the Sachs report, which I hadn't read for quite a while, and I thought, oh, God, no wonder, you know, nothing ever happens here because it's just that complicated. Um, Alf and Dennis, to a degree, had really encouraged us to become more active with the legislature to try to help educate them. That led in turn to the formation of another group, which you've heard about earlier, which is the California uh, Groundwater Coalition, a group of very, I'm going to say, progressive. We are urban. We didn't really set a, uh, a rule about being urban, but uh, all of our current members are urban water managers. And the real goal of the organization was to pull out the groundwater issue and make it clear that we are in favor of groundwater management and that we are in favor of seeing this resource managed properly. That does not mean that we are in favor of expanded jurisdiction at the State Water Resources Control Board or state regulatory regimes that we think would, in fact, be counterproductive uh, to looking at doing these things cooperatively at the local level. Um, so with those, I want to do go through uh, really my uh, a slide presentation, and I'll, I'll do the intro by saying I'm sure it broke Dennis O'Connor's heart when the Water Replenishment District and all of the uh, members of the Central and West Basin, very large, large group, had been literally at war uh, for decades in the capital. And um, this is really a success story about how you can manage groundwater cooperatively locally in order to achieve the kind of goals that are really laid out in the Sachs report. So I'm going to go through this real quick. Um, and I think, again, it kind of shows you that it can be done and it can be done without uh, state uh, mandates. 
So it's a very critical, large, important area. And Albert Robles, there he is. We got the president of WRD here today. Uh, 420 square miles, very large area, serves 4 million people, 635,000 acre feet of water used each year, so you can see very significant challenges. Now we get to the governance issues, 43 cities, a county, one water replenishment district, two municipal water districts, a metropolitan water district, hundreds of groundwater producers under uh, an adjudication that, that covered water rights but not storage, uh, and one water master at the Department of Water Resources. So if you don't think that that doesn't add up to a complicated <laughs> governance situation, uh, think again, and it was crazy. Uh, this shows you the, uh, the area which is the central and west coast basin of Los Angeles, a uh, very, uh, very important region and a very important resource. There we go. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the basins were adjudicated in the early 1960s, uh, but the real key was that the adjudications did not address water storage. And so we had uh, a history really of uh, some challenges and the ability of being able to utilize this basin. And really, as everyone always said, you could put water in, but if you tried to take it out, you were gonna be in court. Um, imported water in this area historically provided 60% of the supply uh, with groundwater providing 40%. Um, but there's a key feature, and this is becoming more key every day. Uh, the cost of groundwater historically is, is much less than the cost of imported water. So this becomes a very important asset. Um, let's see, we've got, there we go. Okay, this is what the fight was really about, was 450,000 acre feet of storage, which is a, a pretty good asset. Um, and uh, the existing pumping rights, which were the subject of the adjudication, were the 282,000 acre feet. Uh, this shows you what can be done if you, you know, if you're operating, whether it's, you know, seven out of 10, which would be better, but three out of 10, you've really got to use this basin. and. You put the water in in a wet, wet year and be prepared to take it out in a dry year. You can't do that if you're in court uh, or if you're, um, if you're litigating your uh, outcomes. So um, again, almost half a million acre feet of storage. You can see the importance of this at the local level. This is gonna provide a tremendous ability to mitigate rate increases, increase water supply reliability, and, uh, and provide substantial benefits for the region. Um, I won't go through all this, but uh, trust me, there was a very, very long history here of people fighting each other in every possible way a lawyer could be employed. Uh, lobbyists, uh, consultants, you name it. Uh, it was a long, long history of, um, of, of controversy and conflict. And we got together under the leadership of the various parties that were involved, which included uh, Lester Snow and, and the Department of Water Resources. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but you know the groundwater producer <coughs> objectives, I would put this under that critical category of rights. Uh, these, these rights couldn't just be rolled over. They had, to be, they had to be taken into account. The groundwater producers who had adjudicated water rights had a certain set of objectives. And so everybody came around the table and, and we were able to come to some concurrence, largely at least, about, uh, but these groundwater uh, rights and uh, objectives were recognized in the negotiation. Again, I won't go into the details of what we worked out. All the law students later can look at this one. Uh, this is what a good, a good deal ends up looking like. It's really complicated, but you know, and it takes a while to do it, but it can be done is really the key. Uh, water master, we moved from a state water master to a locally based uh, management regime. And this was a, was a very important deal. No one party got control. Nobody got to boss anybody around. Uh, it, was, it really became a cooperative, uh, water master situation, and that's I think was very key to getting it done. You can see here that the the level of support in this highly complex region of Los Angeles, outlined in the green here, uh, is very very high. We're in uh, court now, uh, trying to uh, confirm these uh, amended adjudications. Uh, there is a whole bunch of stuff we decided not to litigate. We, we said not every issue needs to be decided. We don't need to decide what each uh, agencies, each party's ultimate authority is over groundwater. If we'd taken that approach, we'd still be fighting about it. So it is a Southern California success story. It's a California success story. Personally, I believe more adjudications will occur. I think that's the right way to go. You recognize the rights, you work out plans that work for everybody, and hopefully um, everybody comes out ahead and, and you don't have to really address um, all those issues that are in the SACS report.
Dennis, you had a question. Did you have a comment? You, when you finished off, you said there was a point you wanted oh, to. Oh well, I was just going to say that um, you know on the on the question of, of why why did we go through all this effort over the last few years on on, on uh, groundwater management? Um, the 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 thing that I, I like to point out is, is that uh, monitoring elevation is like taking your temperature. You don't know, you know, if you, you stick it in, if the elevations are holding stable, you know, you don't have to do anything more. If your temperature goes up, okay, then you have to do more studies to find out what's going on. At the very least now, we set up the thing, so throughout California's 510 basins and sub-basins, periodically we're going to be taking the temperature. Um, and and that's important because even in our re more remote um, uh, basins and sub-basins because, uh, for example, we have the Cadiz groundwater plan where they're going to, uh, I, I saw they just approved it, I, I mean, I can't believe that. Uh, but but it, it's a remote basin out in the desert, it completely overlined by, overlaid by uh, one agricultural company what they're going to do is they're going to w draw down the groundwater basin some and then bring in imported water and store it there. So they're going to be able to sell off a portion of the groundwater and then be able to conjunctively manage the rest of it. The big question all along was, so what would that do to the lo local ecosystem? If you're not monitor monitoring the, getting some baseline elevations and going, getting some sense for how the basin actually operates, it's very, very hard to answer those kinds of questions and to take advantage of some of those remote uh, groundwater basins where it might be beneficial to uh, develop and manage the storage. An example. I'll take uh, one, one question to, to Chris. Uh, you were sort of you know, describing the success, as you saw it, that they've had in the Los Angeles Basin in terms of the groundwater management plan. As you look at some of the more rural and agricultural groundwater basins where there seems to be often more resistance to these types of plans, are there any lessons that you see in the sort of the Southern California urban context that might lend themselves to greater success um, in some of these less urbanized groundwater basins? Well, I think, I think the first thing, in all honesty, is desperation. I, I didn't go through the specifics of the slide, but the truth is that in the Central and West Basin, the region couldn't qualify for integrated regional water management planning funds, I mean, which is, I mean, big asterisk because we'll see how much money is available in the future, but the carrots that were out there uh, were unavailable if you weren't basically doing the right thing. So in my view, I think that reality is going to be the driver. I think that the harsh circumstances that we find ourselves in right now from the standpoint of where the water supply is and what the solutions are going to look like and who you're going to need to help you, um, I, think that the, I think those dynamics will accelerate some of the issues which have been uh, pending and you know, admittedly not resolved over the past couple decades. Well, let me jump in on that a little bit. Um, one of the things, while the members of the legislature may not be um, particularly interested in, in tweaking water law to reflect or not reflect uh, the Sachs report or any of these other sorts of things, they're very willing to get involved in disputes between um, governmental organizations. Uh, there was a while there when I just, you know, there were like three or four uh, WRD bills introduced each year because one group or another person thought that somebody was acting in an inappropriate manner and depending on the day of the week I figured that, I, I knew we had one too many organizations but I, my opinion on who, who the superfluous one was changed depending on who was last in my office. Um, and I do think that uh, we're going to see, uh, as information about the, the groundwater elevations become more known, we are going to see people starting to get a little grouchy about how things are behaving. You know, uh, there will be interest in trying to get counties to step in and do more because, you know, you, you don't trust, who, who do you trust if you're in a rural district? Uh, um, you know, there's going to be interest in forming, you know, as, as a counter to that, getting some new organic acts introduced, you know, to create new groundwater management stuff. I do think a fair amount of that stuff's going to go on. And that's the sort of, I mean, most of our members have a background in local government. They all believe they know how local government works. And that's an area where there's quite possible to be a fair amount of, uh, 
uh, legislation in the in the coming years. I think I'd add to that too. That I should have mentioned that I think that the the provisions in the bill that relate to uh, beginning to inventory, if you will, um, who's doing what out there, and I think what we'll see evolve out of that, in addition to just in increased information being available, is that you will have, you, you know, there's going to be the good list and there's going to be the not so good list and I think that there will be inducements to try to improve your behavior but rather than be taking approaches that are broad brush approaches that apply to everyone which often is what would result I think in a lot of the controversy over these bills is that you can start to focus it on regions that are not voluntarily doing the right thing and I do think this bill was was you know again I think it hit the political will point that that made sense a lot of people think it didn't go go far enough a lot of other people felt well you know what we can get it done you can get it signed and it's going to be a big step in the right direction of more information yes we have a question desperate I'm sorry. Sorry, you mentioned desperation kind of motivated this group to come together, and you're talking about incentives in terms of information. I'm really curious in terms of this case, and also maybe commenting more generally, how the threat or prospect of more pervasive state regulation motivated the actors, because you're talking about um, basically people are trying to scurry to get their act together so they're not regulated by the state. If the state's not threatening to regulate them, there's no need to scurry. Oh, I think everybody, um if you don't feel threatened, you better go check with somebody <laughs> because you should, you should feel threatened. I mean, I think that the movement and direction of the legislature toward, toward groundwater uh, it has been tr you know, serious over the past few years. So you, know, you see, need a lobbyist or a lawyer to yeah, one consult of the, with. One of the key incentives in, in the various versions of the, uh, the groundwater monitoring bill was that if nobody stepped forward to do the monitoring, DWR would step in and do it for you. And in all except the ultimate version of the bill, DWR would get to charge the, the groundwater uh, well owners the, uh, the cost to recover its cost for monitoring. Um, that was seen by many to be a much bigger threat than what ended up being in the bill uh, being that you wouldn't be eligible for, for bond funds. Um, and in fact, I think that was part of the reason why uh, the bill was ultimately changed at the end is that the threat of DWR coming in, being able to um, require you to provide them data or they'll, you know, they'll do it for you uh, was, was a little scary to some. I'd like to, okay. Can I, can I, with, with I, that quick comment, I've got, over a, time. I got a personal uh, experience that goes to your question. In the Salinas Valley, um, for years and years, they've had seawater intrusion in their basin, as you all know. And starting about 15, 20 years ago, the State Water Board, I'm sure Andy was involved in this, started writing letters to the county saying, if you don't do something about this, the state's going to come in and adjudicate your, your basin. And it took a while, but I do think, and I have to give some credit to, to the board on this, that, that that stick eventually coalesced that agricultural community and allowed them to move forward with some projects that I think are going to solve that problem. So I, I don't completely discount the idea that sometimes the state can play a useful role in this. Okay, so I'd like to thank our panelists. <laughs> just, just to occasionally, give me one thing. Just to sort of close out this panel and bring it full circle to where we began. I began at the beginning in my introductory remarks talking about the rule of capture that we used to have. And one of the reasons that we had the rule of capture uh, with groundwater law was due to the same informational restraints that we're talking about. Essentially, there are early decisions where judges said, no man can tell. It was, there was just too much mystery and unknown to be able to adopt any type of right system. And it wasn't until we actually had better data and better understanding of hydrology and hydrogeology that we finally moved from a law of capture to a law of correlative rights and reasonable uses. I think what we're seeing now is we're getting better information. And whether that happens at the local level or the state level, hopefully we're going to see a similar evolution uh, in our governance, management, legal structures, call it what you will, based on that. So with that, I'll turn it over. Professor Cabell, and thank you to the panelists here and to all the other panelists today for what was an incredibly thought-provoking and lively discussions.
I want to also make sure to make special thanks to the co-chairs who were phenomenal in putting together these sessions. I, special recognition to Olivia Odin and to um, Ian Fine from UC Berkeley Schools of Law, School of Law, to Michael Smith from UC Hastings, and to Seth Manser, and also, um, he's not here right now, but Anthony Austin from Golden Gate School of Law. Golden Gate with Hope, we're hoping, will sponsor the symposium with us next, for us next year. And a thank you to all of you for attending today. It's been fantastic. I want to make sure you know that materials are posted on the website. There's materials from past symposiums and also for today. And before you leave today, if you're going for MCLE credits, please make sure to put your surveys and also your customer um, surveys for the symposium in the boxes that are at the table as you leave. And um, also, if you haven't registered already, some people I know walked in today, if you haven't registered, go to the waterlawsymposium.com website and register your name because there will be a video available of today's symposium and we'll be sending out notifications when that's ready so that you can look at it online. And finally, most important, maybe actually not most important, but definitely something I'm looking forward to, we're having a reception. I hope you'll join us tonight. We'll have hors d'oeuvres and wine in the lobby. And thank you so much for being here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what point are you trying to make? <laughs>